I'm Dan Ennis, and hopefully you're here for M219, which is the principles and applications of magnetic resonance imaging. Um, what I was trying to get set up there at the, at the very beginning uh, is a way where I can present from my iPad, and there's a couple reasons I want to do that. But one is when we're working on the board. This room is not great for that, because I have to put the screen up and back, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. And if I'm working on my iPad, I'm also not in front of what I'm writing. And so everyone in the room can see it pretty easily. So I'll, I'll get that dialed in later. I'll we'll take one more lecture. Uh, so again, sorry for that. Uh, hopefully this is the class that you're here for. Uh, and we have this unfortunate situation of uh, Tyler's going to help you with that slides. So I like having a little bit of fun here um, at the very beginning uh, of this class. So this is, this is really important. This is probably, well, this slide is, I think, like 5% of your and it is identically, word for word, the first question on the final exam. Okay? Uh, so why is this so important to me? Well, <coughs> what does it say? It's clearly explained how MRI works. Be sure to explain the role of various hardware components in converting proton spins into magnetic images. And that's what this class is really about. Teaching you some of the basic sort of physics and chemistry behind the so-called NMR phenomena, and then how we uh, have discovered over the years uh, through some really uh, ingenious inventions how to turn that into a technique or technology capable of high quality imagination. And so you will be asked to answer this exact question uh, on March 11th or something like that. Uh, and this is closed book. Uh, the rest of the exam is open to note. Uh, so we'll talk, we'll talk more about the final exam when we get there. But uh, it's my failure if at the end of this course, 10 weeks, you're not able to answer that question. Okay. Especially because I didn't need a question. Tyler, you want? So this is a, kind of an outline, one structured outline for both the course and a great way to answer that first question. Okay? This is borrowed in part from a book that we'll talk about later. Uh, but we were basically going to step through this whole diagram over the course of the next about eight weeks. Uh, and then the last two weeks, we'll have some invited speakers come and talk about some specialized research topics. And so what this, I won't go into all the details, because of course that's what the whole course is going to uh, be doing. Uh, but we're going to learn how it is that we go for what we call an individual magnetic moment or magnetic dipole. And that's the idea that the hydrogen nucleus in water uh, behaves like a small little bar magnet, remarkably. Uh, and it's the whole conceptual framework for how we go from understanding something about these individual magnetic dipoles, uh, how they ultimately can constitute what we call bulk magnetization. And through the application of different magnetic fields and signal processing and detection approaches, we can ultimately form a group. So again, the goal isn't to go through this whole slide in detail today, but it's going to be a framework that you know roughly the next eight weeks of lectures are on. Uh, so keep this in mind. We'll keep coming back. Uh, a little bit of detail about how the course is going to run and how the course is going to work. Uh, there is a course website that you can go to. I haven't gotten to the hang of using the CCLE, which I think is used for maybe some of your other classes. Everything for this class will happen just over email, uh, either the way I sent it to you today or I'll create a distribution list to use. Um, and you can go to these websites to see both the syllabus and some more information about the class. Uh, Tyler, do you mind clicking actually on that link? I should turn this out to you. Yeah. Yeah, and so this will get updated as the class sort of develops. And so uh, part of what I try to do for this class is post the slides in advance. And so you can click there, get a PDF, and it'll be a slide deck for today's lecture. Uh, and I'll also bring the class uh, a copy like you have today, which I think has been a good format sort of based on feedback from folks like yourselves over the years where there's space to make notes and you can sort of keep track of things that way as well. Uh, if all goes well, that little laptop's also recording the lecture. We'll see what the audio quality is like today. The setup's not quite perfect, uh, but the video quality is pretty good. Uh, and those will get posted to YouTube. And so you'll have access to the material sort of at different times. Sort of course. So I'll try to get those posted sort of the same week. I'm sure. uh, it takes a minute time to do that. So this will be the basic structure. You'll be able to download the slides. When there's code, we'll be using MATLAB coding in this class for your homework assignments. Uh, and so when there's code snippets that I've developed for you to use, you'll be able to download those things. You'll be able to link out to YouTube videos that are just audio recordings with the slides synced to it uh, through YouTube. And then there'll be some other things as well. Occasionally, some uh, reading-oriented material. I don't actually follow, I'll show you the textbook in a second. I don't follow the textbook too closely. Uh, but I've gone through to identify what chapters in the book relate to the lecture material. That you're covering. And then occasionally, I'll give you links to PDFs as well, just supplementary material. If you think the topic is interesting, there's a paper that I think is sort of 
none of the reading is required to say. Everything that I think you need to know is really good. Um, what you'll notice already, a lot of those links are broken uh, because they're not populated yet, but you'll see that there's a homework zero. Uh, homework zero is an ungraded assignment. Um, raise your hand quickly if you've used MATLAB before. Yeah, okay. So it looks like virtually everyone. Uh, this class will use MATLAB. Nothing especially complicated, to be honest, but you need some familiarity with using MATLAB. Homework zero is just an, ass an assignment, ungraded assignment. You Turn it in, uh, but it's a framework for you to get some basic understanding, entry point to uh, using MATLAB that's related at least a little bit to the class. Uh, it's not based on some of the physics uh, topics or chemistry topics or MRI topics per se, but just the basic tools that you'll need to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, anyway, so this will get sort of populated during the quarter. Um, to, to remember. <coughs> uh, just how the course runs there's going to be four homework assignments, 15 points, and there's two labs. The labs right now are already scheduled for the night of 221 and uh, 3.7, so we're a little bit deeper into the quarter. Uh, the labs will run from 6 to 9 p.m., but it's two blocks, or should be two blocks. So we'll have a group go from 6 to about 7.30. We'll have another group go from about 7.30 to 9. Uh, we'll form small groups, and you might as well stick with the same group for both labs, and I'll try to do what I can to accommodate you know, whatever, other, uh, whatever other conflicts you might have, whether it's an evening commitment or something like that. I'll do my best, but the dates are pretty firm. Those are hard to move around. We're going to be using the clinical MR systems in our MR clinical center, uh, and we just have, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to get time for 20 of us or whatever to use the standards for two hours. Uh, if that is known to present a conflict for several of you, uh, let me know immediately. Uh, we'll see what we can do about the dates. Uh, we'll get a little bit organized uh, about that as we go. Uh, like I said, so it's a for about five or six weeks. And then there's a final exam that we'll have uh, presumably in this room. Uh, that's scheduled already for Tuesday, March 20th from 1 to 4. So again, if that's a conflict with another exam or another course that you're taking, let me know as soon as possible. Um, and that's the general sort of flow for the class. If you go back to the syllabus that we just had, you don't need to. Remember. If you do, you'll see sort of when the homework assignments pop up and things like that. There's not too much overlap. It's sort of get a homework assignment, turn it in, get a lab, turn it in. Um, like I said, we will use MATLAB for this class. Nothing especially complicated, uh, but it will help you uh, help us demonstrate some of the physics of MR. And so there is this sort of self-study. <coughs> zero. Uh, if you haven't used MATLAB before, even if you have, I guess check that out. Uh, the only sort of advanced thing that's discussed there is the use of functions. So not just scripts, but functions. But that's pretty straightforward if you've used MATLAB before. Um, and I'll talk about it in just a second, but we have a couple of TAs that can help. Um, and MATLAB is required for the homeworks and labs. I had someone maybe two years ago come to me about week four and say, I just really don't want to use MATLAB. Like, I was like, it wasn't really a good alternative. Uh, anyway, thanks. So these are, uh, this is on the left is the book. This is the book that, we're, that I'm largely going to follow. I structure the, the lectures a little bit differently than he orders the book itself. But again, this is the thing that's most closely related to what we're doing. Uh, the good news is if you go to this link, you can download the PDF for free. Right? So uh, hopefully uh, that's an acceptable cost. Um, there are some other books that I think are great references. If you happen to be going down sort of a future of working in MR or thinking that you might, all four of those books are actually terrific. Um, uh, I can talk more about that. I'm not using those in a specific way for this class, but they are good reference books if you want to understand a topic that's uh, not as well developed either in lecture or in you know, a This book is great. Ji Pei Liang is just brilliant. And Paul Lauterbur, uh, rest in peace, was a Nobel laureate for uh, MR. Uh, so office hours and TAs, uh, discussions with me. Uh, the easiest thing is going to be immediately after lecture. I know that's like getting out of against dinner time or your softball team or whatever, uh, but that's one opportunity. Otherwise, just email me and we'll try to find the time to fix um, um, And then I've got three of my graduate students from my lab that will help uh, just with general sort of Q&A. Uh, they've all taken this class, uh, 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 taken each once and then TA a couple times before, except for now, actually, who's now just a second year student. And so the plan is that uh, Nasha, Patrick, and Jessica are available from 4 to 5 on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So the days we don't have lecture. Um, again, if that's a, an 
overt conflict for a bunch of you that you can never get to office hours because you have a limited supply of or something. Just let me know. We'll see what we can do. Um, you can basically reach out to them anytime you want to. That's at least the understanding I have with them. Just email them directly and they'll answer questions. Or you can email me directly and I'll try to clarify things. Uh, if you ask me questions, I'll try to give both the question and the answer back to the whole group so people can get the same information. Um, bottom line, we also uh, sort of assign the assignments to the TAs. And so you can see that NIOSH is kind of responsible for lab two, homework zero, and homework three. So when things get busy and you're really working on homework three um, and you can't make it to one of the normal office hours, she's kind of the go-to person for that particular assignment. And that way they have each expertise on those individual assignments and they'll be sort of the most facile and able to answer questions about that. Cool? Uh, yeah, so everyone knows D. Reese. And so we're, we're up just a bit from degrees. So if you're in the medical plaza, uh, or down by Reagan, a lot of people walk to Westwood, they go through a building. Is that familiar? You go like, there's a building that it seems like everyone has thousands of people a day go through a building. Ubroth is, is basically the southernmost uh, medical campus building. So it's right, uh, let's see, west of Westwood and right on Montage. Uh, you can look it up. We have a, a map on the syllabus. It's at the end of Broxton. Yeah, the corner, yeah. Yeah, sort of the intersection of Broxton. Yeah. Close to Starbucks. Uh, there'll be uh, different guest lectures that come in during the course for different reasons. Uh, as things happen, I've got both the conference and responsibilities of the NIH that happen in the middle of the quarter. So I'll miss, I think, three lectures in a row. Uh, fortunately, you'll be in the capable hands of Mike, who's a postdoc in my group, and Kyung, who's uh, certainly uh, as expert as anyone. And then towards the end of the quarter, uh, Mike will come back, and then Holden, Pong, and Ben will come talk about some of the research topics that are obviously related to the things that we're doing during the course or in the same course. Uh, I hate to even have to bring it up, but just try not to. If you, if you need to, I get it. If you need to, just step out. I don't care. You don't need to raise your hand. Just walk out and do whatever you have to. But it's really distracting to come up here and do what you want. So uh, I apologize. I'm so frail and distractible by your cell phone, but it's just. Okay, uh, questions about sort of just how the course is set up or how you get access to the things that you might need for the class? I think that's pretty straightforward. And most of it's just going to be uh, And I'll do my best to do that. Okay, so the plan for today is actually to get right to the material. We're going to talk about one of the main uh, magnetic fields. So when you think of an MR system, what does everyone think of? It's the first thing you sort of think of. Big magnet, right? Yeah, so there's some big, strong magnet that's needed for something, right? And that's, of course, critical. It's very important. Uh, not strictly required, as it turns out, for NMR, but, but the most widely used applications of NMR use a very strong magnet. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the learning objectives for each class. The goal here is that I've identified what I think is important about this lecture. There's always going to be some, some other material, right? Some, some uh, supplementary material, some things I think would be interesting for you to know, uh, but in some sense maybe they're not required that you know them, right? Uh, these are the things that I would expect you to really sort of know and understand at the end of this particular lecture. And again, I'm not going to drill through each of these, but they map really closely to the slides. So that's just one way for you to review the material when you're studying and so forth to know what I think uh, you should know. Okay, so, uh, and, and I should uh, back up a, leave the slide there, but uh, I should back up a little bit. If you took 205 with me last quarter, the first couple lectures, you're going to see some material that looks familiar. Uh, we're going to go a little bit more in depth in all of that material, but at least for the first couple lectures, uh, hopefully it's just comfortable and easy. Uh, nothing too uh, crazy quite yet, but we'll, we'll get into it soon. Okay, so what is MRI? Uh, what, is, what does it stand for? Well, obviously it stands for magnetic. It needs several different magnetic fields. That diagram that I showed you going back five or six slides, uh, actually was outlining the different magnetic fields that we need to use. And there are a wide range of scales from micro Tesla to Tesla, and a wide range of temporal scales from microseconds to many seconds. Uh, so it's really a kind of intriguing technology in that it really maps across, you know, you know, six orders of magnitude in magnetic field strength and temporal scales. Uh, and those are in some sense required to, to do what we do. Uh, there's something resonant here. Uh, so magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, the excitation energy that we use in MR has to be on resonance with something. And this is something that we'll really learn more about in the third lecture. Uh, 
Uh, it really is sort of a classic excitation reception paradigm, right? You're going to excite the system with a specific form of electromagnetic radio frequency energy. That's going to excite, as it turns out, uh, the magnetic dipole moments of the hydrogen nucleus, and we're going to almost magically be able to use that to form images. Uh, so for now, we just want to remember that we need excitation energy to be at a particular frequency. That fre frequency has to be on resonance with the underlying system itself. And of course, the last thing is that it's energy, right? We're going to understand the physical principles, the mathematical principles well enough to appreciate how something that's really happening at the, you know, the atomic level is useful for forming images or maybe even pictures. Uh, okay, so I said this a little bit before, uh, MRI follows this sort of classic excitation reception paradigm. When we think of excitation, what we're really talking about is what we call radio frequency pulses. Radio frequency just means something in electromagnetic energy in a sort of megahertz range, right? And so most of the frequencies that we care about in MRI are in the megahertz range or even hundreds of megahertz range. Uh, so in this case, we need an RF pulse, which is the basis for excitation. We need the RF energy into this system, that could be an individual, it could be phantom could be a piece of fruit. Uh, we're going to put RF energy into the system at a particular frequency so that we can so-called excite it. And then the next step after that is that we're able to generate, sorry, uh, you'll be able to uh, receive something. And what we're able to receive uh, after having excited the system with radio frequency energy, there's a signal that we can receive with a coil. Uh, and that signal that we receive goes by one of two names. It's either what we call a free induction decay or an echo. Echoes are kind of the most common thing that Use for generating images in MR. And so you can think about putting energy into the system, and with a slight delay, there's, there's a form of energy that comes back out of the system that's detectable. Uh, and that's detectable through Faraday's law of induction, which it's here. And so, quite simply, Faraday's law of induction just informs us or tells us that if we have a time varying magnetic field, in this case, a guy moving a magnet back and forth relative to a loop of wire or a coil, that will induce a voltage that's detectable and measurable. And that's really kind of magical uh, when you think about it. And this is exactly what happens in an MR ex uh, experiment. There are magnetic dipoles in your moment, uh, in your body, uh, that are excited. Uh, and there's a coil that we place, say, on your chest or around your head. Uh, and through Faraday's law of induction, we're able to receive a voltage signal that we can record to a computer that tells us about the state of the spin system inside your body uh, and, and, and rather remarkably form you know, images of, of different uh, contrasts. Uh, so the big trick in all of this is to encode spatial information and imaging contrast into the echo. So you might sort of naively or, or sort of have some background already in MR and say, okay, I can get it. If I put radio frequency into a system, there's some energy that's at that same frequency coming back out of the system. That maybe sort of makes sense to me. I can pick it up through Faraday's law of induction. Okay, okay. Uh, but the real magic of MR, the trick, is how do you turn that received information uh, or how do you encode in that received information spatial information so that you can form a two or even three dimensional image or a time resolved uh, two or three dimensional image. And then one of the uh, really wonderful things that we'll explore in this class is how it is that we go about generating different forms of image contrast. One of the big strengths of MR is not just that we get a single sort of, you know, kind of image, but that we can get a, a huge variety of images that report on all kinds of uh, physiologic events and tell us a great deal about actual structure of tissue, function of tissue, Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll continue through just sort of this intro of MR and think about MR advantages. Um, the biggest one, which I already mentioned, is soft, soft tissue contrast. Off the board. And so what you'll see here in this image, uh, uh, this sort of coronal image of this individual, is obviously different tissue types have very different signal intensities, right? Very, very bright tissues uh, are very, very bright. Uh, signal intensities, for example, are seen subcutaneously you near know, the skin here uh, and also inside uh, long bone. And that's actually associated with fat. A lot of MR images, uh, the image contrast is such that fat typically looks pretty bright. Um, and one of the really remarkable things is not only that, the, the, that MR has abundant what we call soft tissue contrast, right? We can see that muscle is different than bone, it's different than marrow, and that maybe looks different than liver, and that looks different yet than, say, the lungs. Um, but what's really neat isn't just that we have contrast, but the ability to manipulate. Right? We can not just window level and change something on a computer, but we can manipulate the, the physics of the spin system in such a way that we can get a, bigger, a big wide range of 
uh, image contrast. And so on the left-hand side here, this is an axial image through someone's head, and you can see that there's really not a whole lot of contrast there in the brain, right? The brain image signal intensities are pretty flat. Turns out this image here is actually a measure of the density of protons. Uh, different tissues have different water content, and consequently have different densities of protons. So we call that a proton density wave image. We'll learn a lot more about this as the class develops. But remarkably, that same, that same uh, anatomical location, right, that same axial slice, just by changing some timing parameters in the so-called MR experiment, we can get very different image contrasts. Uh, we can, in fact, make a particular tissue dark. Right? So here you can see that the white matter of the brain, uh, the darkest sort of web structure that you see in the head there, is really, really dark. And we can do that by adjusting timing parameters on the scanner. And if you look really carefully, this image on the left-hand side and the far right-hand side, their contrast is actually somewhat inverted. So white matter is bright on the right-hand side, and the gray matter is dark. And on the left-hand side here, the gray matter is darker, and the white matter is brighter. Or, sorry, other way around. Gray matter. White matter is darker, and the gray matter is brighter. Um, so really kind of a remarkable thing that not through the administration of a contrast agent, not through the administration of more dose of something, uh, but just by changing timing parameters, you can get uh, remarkable changes in image contrast. And that's useful for uh, detecting disease, diagnosing disease, staging disease, uh, you know, seeing aggression disease, response to therapy, uh, surgical planning, all kinds of things. Um, one spent a lot of time on this. This is sort of just uh, keying up for some things that will come much later in the quarter. But one of the really emerging topics in MR right now from a, from a sort of diagnostic and even a research perspective is so-called quantitative tissue characterization. So the more and more we understand the physics and the more and more, which, uh, more, and more we can sort of manipulate the physics and do so uh, quickly, meaning in the order of minutes, meaning uh, examinations for patients are you know, tens of minutes rather than days. Uh, we can really explore some really detailed information about the underlying tissues themselves. And so we'll spend quite a bit of time understanding what it means to have a, a T1, T2, T2 star, or a proton density wave image. I'll move into that a little bit in the previous slide. But remarkably, we can also sensitize the, the image signal intensity in MR to things like perfusion, how quickly or slowly is, is blood uh, getting into tissues, uh, or to diffusion. How quickly or slowly do water molecules move around, driven through thermal uh, uh, activity uh, in different tissues? Uh, or something that we call susceptibility, which is related to the iron content of different tissues, uh, or through the administration of contrast agents. And so there's really a big push in, in a lot of the labs, and some of the speakers that will come later, and some of the lectures that will come later, uh, will give us some more insight about this idea of being able to do quantitative imaging, with them, which I think is really going to uh, really change radio. Will be one of the, the main themes that changes radiology over the next several years. Um, another great feature of MR is the ability to get arbitrary imaging planes. And so this is not sort of, it's not obvious that that's a feature of MR that you could naturally uh, be able to do that, uh, but it is a fact that it's something that we'll explore when we get into the concepts of, of spatial encoding. And uh, all I want you to sort of recognize for now is that. Uh, it's trivial for us to get images of the head in the sagittal, in sagittal or a coronal, uh, sorry, sagittal axial, axial or a coronal orientation. We can arbitrarily choose the plane that we're going to excite in the person. Why would we want to do that? Well, certain anatomical uh, uh, structures have relatively oblique orientations inside the body. Uh, my lab principally does cardiac imaging. The heart is kind of this unusually shaped organ that's shifted off to the left side and it's not really oriented along any of the sort of main uh, anatomical axes. And so we can tilt the plane uh, in this orientation, and we can in fact tilt it in another orientation, so-called double oblique orientations, and get very specific images of the heart that are the most diagnostically useful for patients. So as, again, as the course develops, you'll understand sort of how it is that we go about doing that. But this is relatively unique for a lot of the so-called tomographic imaging modalities, right? So PET doesn't really do this, CT doesn't really do this. Uh, MR does do this. And I won't spend a lot of time on it today. This is sort of just the, the warm up lecture, uh, but we'll definitely revisit this topic. Uh, and then this is what I said before we can make cool images, right? So, uh, one of the really neat things that we work on in my lab and in some of the related labs is imaging physiologic motion so that we can understand uh, function. And on the right hand side here, we're interested in these kinds of images because they give us so much detailed anatomical information that's also time resolved. 
And so we think we can develop quantitative imaging biomarkers that tell us about the health uh, or the disease or disease progression uh, for various cardiomyopathies. Uh, so that's sort of a little bit specialized for the kinds of work that I do. Uh, but you can also do so-called real-time imaging. So these are images that are acquired with about a 50 millisecond temporal footprint and they're reconstructed in, in less than that time or about that amount of time. And so in this case, just for fun, we've got someone in the scanner who's just you know, moving their head back and forth, sticking out their tongue, and just demonstrating the ability to, in, in very short order, very quick scan times, get so-called uh, real-time MR images. And so this is you know, sort of cutting edge, pretty advanced stuff. And what people are envisioning now is the ability or the possibility of doing interventional procedures, right? So imagine being able to guide or steer a device into a patient uh, with this kind of image contrast where you can see soft tissue uh, contrast, soft tissue landmarks very, very well. Uh, and in fact, uh, much better than you can see those things under x-ray guidance, which is, of course, the sort of mainstay uh, or ultrasound guidance, which is probably, of course, second. Uh, so, you know, this is almost sci-fi stuff, but people have been working on interventional MR procedures for 15 years already, and uh, those are actually emerging as real clinical applications there. Right. Uh, sorry, sorry. You can't skip that one. Yeah. My, this is this is my favorite these favorite slide. Right. Uh, so no ionizing radiation. We'll talk plenty about safety in MR. There definitely are some very real safety considerations. It's definitely an MR environment in which we have to be conscientious of the you know, associated safety uh, and safety impacts. Uh, but the MR scientists, of course, like to uh, go toe to toe with the, with the CT scientists about the use or lack of use of ionizing radiation. So I won't sort of blow that out of proportion, but it is in fact the case that we don't need ionizing radiation. Uh, so that was a bunch of advantages. Of course, there's disadvantages, so we can peel through these as well. Uh, the main things here that I would point out are really related to safety. And when we go through these different hardware components, and this is how this class is kind of structured for the first four lectures, maybe five lectures, we're really talking about the different hardware components that contribute to image formation, the ability to manipulate the spin system to form an image. And the magnetic fields that we uh, use, the so-called main field of V0, the radio frequency field that we talked about briefly before, which we refer to as V1, and the radiant fields, which we uh, know as GX, GY, and GZ, those, all of those magnetic fields have associated safety considerations. And so again, we'll, we'll get into that later, uh, but it's something to be obvious about. Probably uh, kind of the, the biggest safety consideration is related to V0. And the idea uh, is, of course, you've got an extremely strong magnetic field here, three Tesla or one and a half Tesla, and you don't want to go into that room with the wrong device. In this case, a ferromagnetic crash pump, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a very expensive uh, day of work. Uh, other disadvantages, MR is oftentimes regarded as somewhat slow. We'll talk a lot about imaging speed and how to accelerate imaging. This is something that's gotten extraordinary amount of attention in MR over the last probably 20 years. Uh, it's certainly not known for being cheap. We'll talk about the expenses. In some ways, it's non-specific. What do I mean by that? Well, PET is a very specific imaging modality, right? It has molecular sensitivity for molecular events. Uh, MR, on the other hand, is much more non-specific. We can see that a, a tumor is bright, or brighter than surrounding tissue. But that doesn't always tell us the information that we may want to know. It tells us that there's a tumor there, but maybe we don't have any, any more specific information about that tumor. Uh, that sort of harkens back to this idea about quantitative imaging. We'd like to use MR to tell us more than just the location of the tumor. We'd like to phenotype it as best we can. And there's a huge amount of work being done by lots of people in lots of places, including here, about how we can do more specific phenotyping of tumors and other forms of disease as well. Um, so in that sense, it can be non-specific relative to, say, pet imaging. Technically, it's, it's plenty complicated. You guys will learn the, the math and physics of it over the next uh, 10 weeks here. Uh, the next challenge, then, is once you understand the math and physics is going to, learn, uh, going to use a scanner. And that's no simple task. So of all the imaging modalities, it's probably the least intuitive uh, to understand and learn about. And then when you go to sit down with a scanner, it's probably one of the more complicated to learn to run. Uh, all of you can do it. It just takes time. Uh, and then maybe a disadvantage is that it's not primary for all indications, right? I'm not, uh, as, as much as I love MR, as much as I've built my career off of it, uh, it doesn't mean MR is the first line imaging modality for all causes, right? Clinicians have to know and understand all imaging modalities to know when CT is the first thing that makes sense for diagnosing that specific disease, and when is ultrasound better, and when is plain photo work, and um, 
Uh, so just, I don't want to overstate it that way. Uh, we'll probably come back more to safety considerations. The biggest one, and you'll hear me emphasize it several times, especially on the day of the labs, uh, but the so-called powerful magnet is always on, right? These B0 magnets, these one and a half and two Tesla fields, we don't turn them off when we go home at the end of the day. Right? They just ramped up, and we'll talk about why that's a useful thing or why it's sort of built that way uh, a little bit later. Um, and then as you get into this, then you know, your friends your friends send you pictures like this of what happened at someone else's site. Right? If that happens at your site, you don't need to send it out. But then someone else sends it, and then, then there's all this on the web, right? The terrible things that people have done. Unfortunately, for the most part, these are inadvertent accidents. They cause you know, some alarm and maybe some uh, minimal damage. Uh, but unfortunately, in the worst case scenarios, uh, someone has brought a ferromagnetic oxygen canister into an MR suite that's flown out of their hands and actually killed someone. So there is a very real sort of risk associated with uh, this environment. Uh, I won't dwell on this too long. Uh, we'll come back to this when we get to the MR lab, but all these safety considerations warrant patient screening uh, prior to entering into the MR room uh, for a clinical examination. And I'll actually, at the time of the exam, I'll ask you guys to look through this carefully so you really understand what it is that we have to take into consideration. What does largely boils down to is, is probably two things. Do you have any devices implanted in you that may uh, pose a risk to you during, the, uh, MR, during an MR examination? That won't be a problem for the laboratories because you won't be going in the MR scanner itself, but I'll still want to know that I can bring you into that environment safely. Uh, and so as you look through this, it's mostly about the sort of devices that you might have. And so you can see it's about bone joints, uh, bone or joint pins, and certain types of tattoo and body piercings and hearing aids and cochlear neurologic and other ear implants, all kinds of devices. Every patient probably over the age of 50 has something, right? Um, and then the other one that sort of pops up here is about contrast agent reaction. So if you've had a contrast agent administered previously, even for a CT exam, you might have sort of hypersensitivity to these things. Uh, we want to make sure that you're not going to go hypertensive and pass out on a MR scanner if you would so uh, again, we'll, we'll look at this a little more carefully before the actual uh, lab success. Uh, there is a great book here uh, that uh, you can check out if you really get into MR safety. My group does a little bit of MR safety research. Frank Shellock is sort of the, the godfather. He's kind of built his career all around MR safety and every year publishes a, a new version of his handbook. Point being, if you were in a research environment or a clinical environment and a patient had a particular device implanted, you can actually go to his handbook and find out what's known or not known about that particular device and the safety uh, or safety of the risks associated with imaging the patient with that particular device. Lots of possibilities, thousands of devices, right? Um, there are some designations here. There's some language that I, that I want to be clear about as well. And so the FDA uses really specific terms when they talk about MR safety. Uh, one possibility is that a device or something that's going to be used in the MR environment is actually designated as MR safe and has an MR safe label on it. And that's an item known uh, that poses no known hazards in all MR environments. I don't know, this is a terrible example in my mind, a plastic petri dish. It doesn't sort of go together, right, very well, but it's a perfectly fine thing, yes. Uh, but you will, uh, when you walk into an MR suit, you will find some things labeled as MR safe. Oxygen canisters better be labeled as MR safe if you're going to bring it into the MR suite. Uh, other things are not. It's sort of this mixed sort of clinical office environment. So there's a pair of scissors that are sitting there. That are certainly not ferro, that certainly are ferromagnetic. Don't have an MR safe label on it. But they also aren't labeled as MR unsafe, right? So the labeling thing is a little is a little fraught because it's not like everything has a label, right? So the two ends of the spectrum. It can be MR safe or it can be uh, not MR unsafe. Known to pose a hazard. What kinds of things are known to pose a hazard in an MR environment? Uh, all kinds of things, right? It could be the office devices that I was talking about, the floor buffers, the IV poles, the crash carts, uh, wheelchairs, all these kinds of things, office chairs. Uh, sometimes uh, a diligent sort of environment will actually have those things as labeled. So those two ends of the spectrum probably make sense. Uh, what, might be, uh, what, what might make a little, be a little less obvious is a sort of middle distinction here, which is called MR conditional. And so increasingly, uh, manufacturers of different medical devices are requesting uh, F FDA approval for labeling of their devices, so-called MR conditional. Uh, what is MR conditional? It's a device, perhaps a pacemaker, or ICD, or a bagel mace, a nerve stimulator, or an insulin pump, uh, that that company has actually sought FDA labeling for uh, MR conditional in the 
conditional aspect of this means that the item can be brought into the MR environment under certain conditions, and that every device has you know, a multi-page you know, paper that you can read about what are the restrictions on the use of that device. It might be acceptable for all use at 1.5T, but not approved for use at 3T. Just depends on what labeling and what conditions the company sought from FDA at that time. This is important to me because we do work in MR safety, uh, specifically related to pacemakers and ICDs. And so these manufacturers are working furiously to produce designs that are uh, increasingly safe and, in fact, have fewer and fewer conditions associated with them. So that I don't think it's very far off that pacemakers and relatively complicated devices may even just be labeled as MR safe. Uh, if you're still in disadvantages, we're coming back to it. So MR is expensive, right? Uh, I won't dwell on this for too long. It's about a million dollars in Tesla. It's going to cost you about half a million or a million dollars to sort of build the room and site it, assuming you already own uh, your hospital. Um, and then service contracts uh, are expensive, 10000 a month or something like that, uh, just to keep it operational and make sure that you can get uh, parts overnight by your manufacturer when something goes down. Uh, you want to keep the uptime on these systems really, really high because you're charging out at about $500 an hour to recuperate those costs. So every day of downtime, you're out you know, $5,000 or $8,000 or something like that. So it's, a, it's an expensive game to sort of get involved in. Uh, you'll learn plenty about this. You could probably just kind of click through this one time. Uh, I, again, won't dwell into all of this, but there's lots of things that make this a technically challenging technique, whether it's the scan parameters, synchronizing the instrumentation with the patient's physiology, asking the patient to hold their breath, contrast agents, coils that we use, and the actual sort of procurement of the examination. Uh, you'll get a little bit of experience with this when we run the MR labs, and you'll learn sort of the, some of the technical complexity of the sort of scan parameters in the top end there as the course uh, moves, moves along. Okay, so let's talk quickly about some requirements for MR. What is, what is it that we have to have in place to do the MR experiment? Uh, you can just go to the bottom of these. So we need to have something that's a so-called NMR active nucleus. And in this class, the thing we're really going to concern ourselves with is the hydrogen nucleus, typically bound to water, but not only bound to water. Our bodies are largely water, right? They're 70 whatever percent or 80 whatever percent water. Uh, and that's the critical you know, atomic nucleus that we use for imaging. But hydrogen can be found in other things, right? It's found in CH groups for fats and carbohydrates and things like that. So fat will produce signals, and the watery tissues in your body will produce signals as well. Uh, but fundamentally, you have to have some kind of NMR active nuclei. You have to have a, a strong magnetic field, the V0 field, and what you want to associate that with is being the polarizer. And we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more clear what that really means, but V0 is critical for sort of organizing the spin system in a coherent way. And then we need to have the exciter. The RF system and the V1 system uh, is the exciter. If you look at this uh, sort of cartoon teardown on the right-hand side, uh, the purple part is what's called the cryostat. We'll talk about that. Inside the cryostat is the main coil windings. This is just a electromagnet. This is just a superconducting electromagnet. Uh, something that this lecture will cover some. Uh, in the middle of all that apparatus is the so-called body transmit receive coil, or the V1 coil. This kind of red structure in the middle, and that's the exciter. That's what we use to excite the spin system to voltage control engines and so forth. Uh, in addition to that, we need the gradients. The gradients' key role is for spatial encoding. And once you've polarized, excited, and spatially encoded your signal, you need to be able to receive it. And you receive it with some nearby coil. Uh, and that's, again, taking advantage of Faraday's law of induction. And then, of course, on the back end, there's a bunch of computers that are needed to both reconstruct and sort of store the data. So, again, just kind of high level flow for uh, how we go from an NMR active nucleus down to. to uh, could be a useful construct for helping you answer that first final question. Okay, so what do we mean by NMR active nuclei? Uh, there's something really remarkable here uh, uh, that we'll talk about in this class, and it's the idea that the proton has uh, mass, which you're familiar with, probably from whatever chemistry classes you've taken before. In addition to mass, it has charge, and so these are sort of you know, familiar concepts, but something that we'll have to understand and learn about in this class is this idea of spin. Uh, and depending on what background you have in physics, that is either a brand new concept and you're going to say, oh, I didn't know that, uh, or you'll have some familiarity with it. Uh, the most basic thing I can say is that uh, for, uh, uh, for, say, the proton here, uh, 
Uh, it has inherent spin, it has inherent charge, it has inherent mass. Right? You can't sort of manipulate how much mass it has. You can't manipulate its charge, and you can't manipulate its spin. It just has spin. Uh, and that's really kind of a, uh, that, that, that's, you know, that, that caused a lot of confusion back in the kind of 20s, 30s, and 40s when people were trying to understand what was really going on uh, at the uh, atomic level. Okay, so where do we get hydrogen? I said this a little bit before, but hydrogen nuclei are going to be found in water, but they're also going to be found in, the, say, the CH2 groups or CH3 or CH4 groups and other things. And there's some interesting effects that happen. Uh, some some, some uh, interesting molecular level things that happen uh, that change the behavior of the proton in the present. The, the, the behavior of the proton depends on its other local uh, nuclei. So whether you're uh, also bound to an oxygen or bound to some carbons and some oxygen later, uh, all of those hydrogen nuclei won't actually behave identically. Uh, and that actually gives us the ability to do imaging of, say, fat separately from imaging of water. Uh, the molecular environments are different enough that and separate out those signals in a pretty useful way. Something that will come much deeper in the class. So where do we get MR signal from? If you look on the right-hand side, you'll, you'll have some answers pretty much right away, right? Uh, we talked about it some, but we're going to get the MR signal from soft tissues, right? Muscles, organs, fat, uh, and lots of fluids as well. CSF fluid, blood fluid, synovial fluid, uh, all kinds of uh, fluids in our bodies. Uh, and while it's important to recognize where we do get signals from, I think it's also useful to think about where we don't get signal from. And so NMR, uh, at least as conventionally used in a clinical environment, is not good for getting signals from uh, especially hard tissues, things like cortical bone, ligaments and tendons, or teeth. We're really good at imaging kind of watery, soft tissues. Um, we also don't get signal from gases, and there's all kinds of different sort of air spaces in our bodies, right? Whether it's the lung air space, our sinuses, bowel gas, or or anything else. So uh, just useful to think about where we do and don't get signal from. And when you look at the image on the right, you can see, for example, that you know the muscles here and the biceps, so they stand out as a sort of intermediate gray scale. And then you have these two thin dark lines. That's the cortical bone. Right? So the cortical bone's not producing a, a useful or, or substantial NMR signal under these conditions. And then uh, concentric, but inside of that cortical bone, you see the long uh, bone has marrow. And that marrow's kind of fat and fat. And a lot of MR images tends to be pretty bright. Uh, that's also sort of a good rule of thumb that fat is typically pretty bright. OK, so uh, what most of this lecture now gets into is this uh, so-called main or B0 field. Let me just see where we are. Yeah. So I think what I'll do, we got a little bit of a uh, late start, which I apologize for. I'm going to go ahead and just pour, well, let's, let's take a short break. Why don't we do that? That seems the polite thing to do. Um, so we'll take, uh, let's take like a five minute break, uh, and then we'll come back and I should be able to get through the last half of the slides in about before we go.
Oh, oh. Yeah, I don't know. Slow me down with questions, right? That's a good, that's a good strategy, uh, and I'm open to that, right? I actually want to get this into more of a sort of discussion phase. And something I didn't sort of mention. Another thing I'm going to try to do this year is actually uh, kind of flip things a little bit, right? And so today, it sort of makes sense that I sort of just talk to you guys and get you oriented towards some of the concepts that I think are important. And we'll do something similar next lecture as well. Um, for the third and fourth lectures, what I'm probably going to do is have you watch last year's lectures, which is available, it's, it was uploaded and recorded last year. You can watch that in advance. If I don't talk fast enough, you can do it at one and a half X or two X, right? Um, and then we'll try to use the time here for a little bit more discussion and some kind of hands-on kinds of things uh, that'll be ultimately related to the instruments. Like so uh, if all goes as planned, the expectation is you will have seen and, and reviewed that material already, for lectures three and four, uh, and then the lecture time, we probably won't need the full two hours, actually. We'll just use the time that we need uh, to sort of get through some concepts. And that'll let me back up a little bit, review, cement a couple topics with you guys, get some feedback with, from you guys about where you're at with the material, and then uh, we'll kind of review and record. So probably kind of a mix of me giving kind of conventional lectures, uh, as well as asking that you review some stuff. Okay, so let's talk about this B0 field. That's what most of the rest of this lecture is about, is sort of what is this B0 field all about? There's some key concepts that uh, you'll need to remember. And I apologize, sometimes things get out of position here. So what do we know about B0? Well, obviously it's a strong magnet. Uh, conceptually, we can think about it as having, there's, there's a coordinate system that we care about, we call it the laboratory coordinate system. And the so-called long axis of the scanner, if you lie down on the table and your head goes in first, that axis is the so-called Z axis. In general. Get more into all of that later. And the, and the magnet itself, of course, has sort of the north and south pole um, associated with it. I said it before, but the B0 is mainly all is to act as a polarizer. And we'll see what that means as we move forward uh, just a little bit. And at least for our clinical and most research applications, typical field strengths are 1.5 Tesla, um, 3 Tesla would be probably the most, two most common field uh, strengths. But so called high field imaging, 7T, uh, 11.4T, and above. Uh, these are sort of emerging research applications. Uh, if I can editorialize for a little bit, I personally am a little skeptical of the advantages of 7T and 11 Tesla imaging, uh, but there's certainly some interesting uh, physics uh, being sorted out there. Uh, and in fact, here at UCLA, we actually have a low field scanner as well. There's a 0.35 Tesla scanner that's part of the therapy system and radiation oncology, and I think there's some really fascinating things that are uh, being worked on in that. So be open minded about the field strength. So we're typically using one and a half and three Tesla systems, the axis of which is sort of Z-oriented. The purpose is the bulk is the so-called polarizer, is that B0 helps us generate so-called bulk magnetization. Uh, bulk magnetization is this concept that while individual hydrogen nuclei are uh, what we call magnetic dipoles, inside of a very small volume, we have Avogadro's numbers, right? Billions and billions and billions of water molecules. And when coherently arranged, we can think of them as uh, uh, behaving similarly such that they constitute what we call bulk magnetization, some sort of observable level of magnetization. Uh, mathematically, we sort of develop that concept a little bit more in the introspection. And so, uh, at least in principle, the more B0 we have, the more bulk magnetization we have available. And that's what really has driven the field to say we need higher and higher and higher fields. Uh, MR is not really a signal-rich imaging modality. We're sort of hovering right on the sort of acceptable signal-to-noise levels. 
uh, and we sort of always hover there because just as we find ways to get more signal to noise, we figure out ways to scan faster, which reduces the signal to noise back to that sort of acceptable level. So we're sort of always kind of hovering right on what's uh, diagnostically acceptable for something like this. And a concept that we'll, we won't really develop until uh, the next lecture is this idea that the B0 field, in fact, any magnetic field, as we'll see, forces the bulk magnetization to precess. So we have to develop these concepts of spin, which we talked about briefly before, of precession, and then later we'll also talk about mutation, all these different ways that uh, uh, these spin systems can be uh, manipulated. Uh, that precessional frequency is associated with what we call the Warmer equation. So this is a, an expression that we'll actually derive in the next lecture. And it basically just says that the precessional frequency, so hydrogen nuclei are going to wobble around at a specific frequency that we call the Warmer frequency, and that's in accordance with the externally applied field, the B field, uh, and what we call the gyromagnetic ratio, something that we'll get into in just a second. Uh, so for each of these main fields that we're going to talk about, the B0 field, the B1 field, and the gradient fields, there's a slide just like this that says the B0 field is, the B1 field is, the gradient fields are. Uh, and so I think those are useful things because you sort of compare and contrast the, the aspects of these different fields. The B0 field is engineered such that it's really spatially uniform. So when I say it's a 1.5 Tesla uh, uh, system, uh, it's very spatially uniform over some volume of interest that we'll talk about. Uh, when I say uniform, it's sort of in the parts per million range. So not 1% of 1.5 Tesla, but parts per million uh, over some volume that we care about, which is typically about 50 centimeters through what we call the isocenter, or just the middle of the scanner. So these are highly engineered systems engineered uh, to such precision that the human body causes more perturbation of the magnetic field than the system has in itself. So the engineering is pretty exceptional. These are temporally stable fields. The B0 field is, for all intents and purposes, it's constant. Uh, it does actually decay slightly. I had a hard time finding real good numbers here, but maybe on the order of a part per million per hour, something like this. So it's a one and a half Tesla system, and at the end of the year, right, it's a 1.49 Tesla system or something like this. So they do drift and sort of decay ever so slightly, uh, but not in a way that's actually relevant for anything we're talking about. And we said this before, but it's oriented along the Z axis. It's a B0 field uh, oriented along the long axis. Uh, it's, it, the right is a vector, the B0 vector, and we can say that it's equal to B0 magnitude oriented along the k direction. We'll use IJK notation for the sort of x, y, and z. Um, these are field strains. It's interesting to think about what it means. I keep saying one and a half Tesla, three Tesla. You may or may not have any sort of concept of really how strong of a magnet that actually is. Uh, one reference that gets thrown out is the Earth's field is about half a Gauss. Okay? It's useful for my compass, but I don't really have a good sense for that. A uh, better reference in my mind is a refrigerator magnet, and that's about 10 or 100 Gauss. So just your classic magnet that you used to stick to fridges before they were all stainless steel. Uh, it's about 10 to 100 Gauss. Um, and so we also have to recognize that in MR we use different magnetic field units. We can talk about Tesla, or we can talk about Gauss. Uh, and unfortunately, we use both you know, all the time. And so there's 10,000 Gauss per Tesla, and so our 3T systems are about 40,000 Gauss. So these are really, really strong magnetic fields. And when we have the MR lab, you're gonna, I want to give you some physical sense for just how strong these lines are. So we'll, we'll play with some throughout. Um, we said this before, a little bit about B0 strength and what are the advantages of having higher and higher B0 strength. Well, increasing the B0 will increase the polarization. Uh, we'll see in a second how we actually have spins in the so-called spin-up and spin-down orientation. And we can manipulate the population of the spin-up versus the spin-down state through the application of higher and higher fields, which give us more and more polarization. In principle, that gives us more bulk magnetization and the more bulk magnetization we have for imaging, uh, that should uh, sort of have some impact on improving overall image quality. Um, without getting into too many details, the signal to noise is, in our images is proportional to about B0 squared to the 7 fourths. Uh, and so uh, we could use that, that, that increased field strength to maybe improve our spatial resolution, maybe improve our, our temporal resolution, or maybe decrease our scan time. Uh, as the course develops, we'll see these sort of competing interests, right? Physicians always want higher spatial resolution, higher temporal resolution, and reduced scan time, right? But those are, those are not, those are at odds with each other. You can't get all of those things for free uh, without the image quality, so it's going to crash. Um, 
so it's the good things that relate to uh, the learner. Uh, what are the disadvantages of having higher and higher uh, B0 field strength? Uh, the, the, amongst them is this idea that the so-called specific absorption ratio. So every time we're using radio frequency energy, that energy, the frequency of that energy has to be aligned or matched with the B0 field strength. Higher and higher fields use higher and higher frequencies. And the frequency of that energy uh, in the, uh, is associated with higher and higher energy deposition in the subject. And so the simple story here is that uh, the use of radio frequency pulses in MR can heat people up. And at higher and higher field strengths, we can heat them more and more and more. FDA, of course, you know, that gets their interest. And so there's rules and regulations about what we call the SAR, the specific absorption ratio. Uh, terrible name for what really just amounts to the ener energy absorbed by the body in watts per kilogram. And so I, I, I hesitate a little bit to sort of make the analogy, but it's basically a microwave, right? You can put electromagnetic energy into the subject or the object and heat them up. And if we do so above certain guidelines, that could be uncomfortable or even dangerous. So this is something that's very carefully uh, sort of monitored and regulated through the developing systems. Something we have to be careful. Uh, increasing the B0 field strength also increases the cost. We said about a million per Tesla. Uh, we'll talk about shielding as well. But when you have a really, really strong magnet, you typically don't want that magnet to be interfering with other things in your environment, right? If you have an OR above your MR suite, you have to shield the OR from the effects of that strong B0 field, right? Uh, and shielding, which is basically just ferromagnetic cladding for the room, is, ex is actually quite expensive for the, the, the volume and, and magnitude of material that's needed. Okay, so let's dig in a little bit to this B0 field and what it's, you know, how it's actually constructed and, and, uh, and what its uh, sort of utility is. So the first thing to understand is something about solenoids. This is just a quick review. You've probably had this before. I'm sure you've had this before in a physics course. We can obviously run current through a wire. And in doing so, we have a right-hand rule that tells us about a magnetic field that will be generated uh, in, in nearby and adjacent to that uh, copper wire. Uh, just moving forward, all this is showing us is that by winding that copper wire in a particular way, sometimes filling that loop of wire and that solenoid with an iron core, we can generate a pretty highly uniform magnetic field inside that so-called solenoid. Uh, and the, uh, this is just all according to Ampere's law. Uh, and this is the, at the most basic level of construction of MR systems. We have a large winding of superconducting wire that forms a solenoid. It's, it's full of current that generates a highly uniform magnetic field. And the interesting thing about the solenoid design is the fact that the magnetic field inside is actually pretty uniform, meaning it doesn't vary much, uh, doesn't vary very much over space. Um, you'll see this in the, uh, actually show up in the first homework assignment. It's a very simple description of the B field in a solenoid, and it depends on some things on the right-hand side. You can drive this as well, perhaps you already have in the earlier EM course. Uh, and all it's really saying is that the magnetic field strength, the B field strength that we're able to generate, depends on a few parameters that we can control. It depends on the current that we're running through that wire. It depends on the number of turns of wire that we have. It depends on the length of the solenoid. And then it depends on the permeability. What do we actually fill uh, the middle of the solenoid with? Now, in our case, what do we fill the middle of the solenoid with? Human. Yeah, yeah, person, so something like water, right? Uh, or without the person in there, then it's just air filled, right? We obviously can't use an iron core to consolidate the magnetic field uh, in these kinds of systems. So depending on exactly what you're uh, trying to calculate uh, the B field in, you have to use the right permeability. But we're somewhere between sort of uh, air and then we should have put water in as well. So you'll use this expression uh, in the first homework assignment just to help you design a magnetic field, what, what kind of current and how many loops and what length do you need to get a field strength that you care about. Um, and then this is, I'm just putting it here, I won't go through it all too carefully right now, but uh, using that same expression, there's some code I'll make available for how you could, uh, <laughs> you can pull the shroud off your MR scanner, you can walk down to the clinical center and do this, and some engineer has written that the current inside your 1.5 T scanner is 508.25 amps. Uh, I found it humorous that it was just written that way, right? I heard someone sort of maybe you know awe a little bit of that. That's an extraordinary amount of current, right? This is this is copper melting levels of current, right? If you're in an MR system and you start thinking about that number, you might start feeling warm, uh, but it, it's just psychological. Um, so bottom line, we can use that current number. We can come up with a number 
of turns for the approximate length of the system that's a meter long and calculate that you can generate, say, a full length of the system. Now, our systems are much more, you know, the engineering design that goes into these systems is far more advanced than these simple expressions uh, uh, would lead us to think. Uh, but uh, it still stands uh, that our systems are approximately uh, generated in this way using extremely high currents as our engineers have been throughout the whole course. Um, so, uh, sorry, go back just really quickly. So, at the bottom of the previous slide, solar, I said solenoids are, are very uniform radially. Right? So if you think about the magnetic field inside the solenoid, we have the z-axis, and then we could say have an x and a y-axis. Along x and along y, the magnetic field is quite uniform. It really is, say, 1.5 Tesla. Um, but it falls off as you go along the z-axis. How much does it fall off? Well, there's some simple expressions for that as well. That's what the next slide is about. <clears throat> and so here, there's just another expression coming out of Ampere's law again, saying, how does the the Z component, so B field subscripted with Z tells us about the Z component of the B field. How does the Z component of the B field change as a function of Z? Right? So we're thinking really if we only care about the Z component, we'll get into reasons for that later. And how much does it change? Well, it depends on the design of your system, and importantly, it depends on the sort of length to radius ratio. The length of your system and the radius of your system give rise to two angles. So this is just a compact or simplified expression that tells us something about how the BZ field changes as a function of Z. Um, what you'll find is that the BZ is really only uniform when the length is much, much longer than the radius, right? Yep. So is that why they don't want to make, uh, they want to make MRI machines as compact as they can? Well, like so. the diameter? I, I might say it a little bit differently. So unfortunately, what this, ex what this expression says is this, that what you really want is a system whose length is 10 meters and whose radius is a tenth of a meter, yeah. right? And that's that's not a great system design, right? Uh, to have someone slide into this extremely long scanner. So then you start getting into much more involved EM simulations of solenoids and multiple overlapping solenoids and current paths, such that you can get a highly uniform field in a compact uh, system. So our systems that we have now are really you know, a meter and a half or something like that, and the radius is maybe half a meter. So these are pretty compact systems, but that won't give you a very uniform field. Uh, so again, you'll actually work with this when we get to the um, when we get to the first homework assignment. And all I'm doing here is just using those expressions from before and plotting out a bunch of examples of what is my B field strength as a function of Z position. And so for these simple expressions, you can see that I have a huge range in B field strength. Uh, except for when I finally get out to a length to radius ratio of about 10. So if I have a long, long, long scanner that's relatively narrow, I can finally get a pretty uniform magnetic field across, in this case, you know, several meters. Now, really simplified version of how to design these kinds of systems, but it helps you get some basic understanding for how to work with the environments on it. Uh, here's a good cutaway. Uh, in fact, one of the PDFs that links off of the syllabus, I think, links out to this slide uh, or a paper that contains this. And this is really just showing that uh, the real system design, in fact, involves several different solenoids and different geometries and different positions that help generate the magnetic field that we really want. We don't care about the complexity of the design. We care about the uniformity of the field. So the engineers have to figure out how do I design any current path uh, that would give me a very uniform field. And so there are superconducting coil configurations that's shown in green, which generates the main B0 field. And in fact, there's also what we call active shielding coils in red, which limit the magnetic field outside of the scanner. What you'd really like to have is a, is a system that has a small installation footprint. Right? You can put it into a smaller space. That space is very costly, especially in hospital environments. And you'd like not to have this one and a half Tesla field reaching into all the other rooms around you and pulling the office chairs towards the walls, right? And so so-called active shielding actually cuts down on the stray field outside the office game itself. So that's another sort of design consideration for these systems. Uh, and in fact, now there's a group at MGH that's working on sort of a tabletop design that probably has about these uh, proportions, meaning that the, the human that's shown here and the scanner that's shown here is about the right uh, sort of geometry for the systems that they're designing. Whereas for the systems that we have right now, uh, the system is probably five times bigger. 
Okay, so uh, it's uh, important that we talk some about superconductivity because that's how these solenoid systems are actually built and put together. They depend on our ability to uh, have huge amounts of current coursing through the solenoids that we can generate in large magnetic fields that we care about. Uh, so these guys, uh, all handsome gentlemen, were uh, got the Nobel Prize in '72 for their the developments in the theory of superconductivity, which is usually called the Barden Cooper Schweifer or BCS theory. And this goes back to the they, they did their work in the 40s or 50s. Uh, so, so what's what's the challenge here? Well, copper wire. You could just design a solenoid from copper wire, right? Copper wire, unfortunately, can only support about 10 amps of current if the wire is about three millimeters in diameter. Uh, and so, you could do that. Uh, the downside would be that that system would have huge amounts of resistive heating, right? So, it would require massive cooling, and it would require constant energy input, right? So, you have this giant, huge, heavy, hot magnet and you're going to have a three megawatt power supply sitting next to it that's just going to be continuously dumping energy into it because of this resistant loss. Uh, and you'll probably just melt the wire anyway. So it's not really a practical design for very high magnetic fields. So where does superconductivity come in? Well, superconductivity easily supports hundreds of amps of current, so high current densities. Uh, and, there's, and there's really no resistive heating. So this idea that you have to continuously put an energy into the system is gone and the dissipated heat uh, energy is also not a problem. And once these systems are ramped up, there's really essentially, we'll talk through some subtle details here, but there's really no energy input once it's ramped up. And that, to me, that's mind blowing, right? You're gonna have a superconducting magnet, you're gonna, you're gonna hook up a power supply on day zero, you're gonna pour in energy, uh, you know, mega, uh, kilojoules of energy uh, until the current's up to 500 amps, and then you're going to turn off the power supply, and that magnet's going to sit there happily generating a one and a half Tesla field for months, even years. Right? That's to me, that's really mind blowing. Uh, so how is that even possible? Uh, obviously, through this uh, concept of what we call superconductivity, and in superconductive uh, materials, the electrical resistance drops abruptly to zero, not sort of close or maybe kind of sort of zero, but like it drops to zero uh, when the material is cooled below its so-called critical temperature. Uh, and you're able at that point to maintain a large current with no applied voltage. And so this is just a plot showing that uh, here it's a little confusing that T stands for temperature uh, versus the T critical. So the temperature uh, is coming down, right? And as you finally, uh, and the resistivity is coming down as well, but it finally drops suddenly when you get below your, your critical temperature. And every superconducting material has its own critical temperature. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit of discussion here about uh, high, low temperature superconductors and, and their importance or potential importance in the uh, So what are the requirements for superconductivity? Well, you need to keep everything really cold. That's one of the first things. Liquid nitrogen is about 77 Kelvin. Liquid helium is about 4.2 Kelvin. Uh, if we look at this table, we'll come to this more so in a second, but the critical temperatures for all of these materials is in the sort of 10, 20 degree range, right? What does that mean? Well, it means you can't. You have to use something like liquid helium to cool these uh, materials down low enough such that they become super con uh, conducting. We'd love to be able to do this at room temperature and save the expense of all the cryogens, or even be able to do this at liquid nitrogen temperatures, which would be cheaper than liquid helium temperatures or the material uh, obtaining liquid helium. Um, so that's when you hear about sort of low temperature or uh, high temperature superconductors, uh, they're sort of outside of this range for sure. Even room temperature. Uh, lots of possible material choices. We don't need to get into all of them. MR systems that we use today use this niobium tin uh, superconducting material here. It has a T critical of about 18 Kelvin. It also has a B critical, a B field critical. So it loses superconductivity if the field is above that field strength. And so if the field's too high or the temperature is too high, you're no longer superconducting. Uh, superconducting magnets are used for other things. Large Hadron Collider uses a different uh, wire type. Uh, and I've already said it, but there's a lot of interest in so-called high-temperature superconductors as well. Um, so uh, we said this a little already. There's there's a maximum uh, field that can be generated inside these superconducting materials themselves, uh, and it's limited by the so-called critical field, uh, the BC, the critical current, the IC, or the critical temperature, the TC. Uh, and so all of those things matter when you're building and constructing these kinds of systems. Uh, if we look at niobium tin and we look at it as a function of field strength or as a function of temperature, 
you can get out the op you can get outside of the critical range. So if you're above TC, you lose superconductivity. If you're above BC, you lose superconductivity. So you have to sort of be inside the envelope of this rough curve. And in fact, the systems we use actually operate in the so-called mixture mode, where it's not quite completely super totally superconducting, but it's uh, it's good enough. Uh, getting into the true sort of superconducting range uh, is really only possible at substantially lower fields or uh, lower temperatures. Uh, I don't really have a, a good explanation for what the mixture mode is, other than it's like somewhere in between uh, normal uh, superconducting materials. So how do we do this? Well, you have these really tiny filaments, about 20 microns thick. Uh, in this case, niobium tin or, or, or titanium or niobium tin, doesn't matter. Uh, except for the applications are a little bit different. Uh, the reason the filaments have to be so small is the current really only flows skin deep. So this idea of superconductivity is a surface phenomenon. It's not transmitting current as you do through sort of a uh, uh, copper wire itself. It's happening all on the surface. So you want really thin wires and millions of them so you can increase the total uh, surface area of the superconducting capacity. And that superconducting wire that we make is really then embedded in a copper matrix. So it's about 80 or 90 percent by volume. And that gives it both mechanical stability as well as a low resistance path for large currents. So there will be times when the system will have very large currents when you're ramping up the system or you're ramping down the system. And if it's an uncontrolled ramp down, we call that a quench. And so there are times where there are large amounts of currents that need to be dissipated relatively quickly, and that's actually uh, useful in that sense that we now have uh, a resistant path that happens through the, the copper uh, matrix that the is embedded in. And so these tiny, tiny, tiny filaments are embedded in copper and then wound in the wires and then spun on anvils to form these really complicated uh, magnetic uh, solenoid designs. I think that's what the next slide shows here. It's just going from that sort of five micron wire level to embedding to actually forming these, finally forming these, these cables, these are called conduits and a cable conductor or something like that, CICCs. And this is sort of the, the, the workable form of the superconducting wire. It has a cable down the middle that you can run superconducting, uh, sorry, uh, cryogenic fluids through the helium, for example, keep the whole system super cold, and then wind these up to form uh, with whatever pattern you've designed to generate the magnetic field that you actually want to generate. So that's sort of just kind of going from micro to macro, if you will, know, in these things. Okay, so how does, that, how does all that superconducting wire and so forth come into forming of the, the actual piezo magnet? Uh, just quickly in the background here, uh, I think you guys will miss it uh, as an opportunity in this class, but we'll take delivery of two new magnets here at UCLA uh, sometime this year. Uh, and that's it's kind of a show, right? I mean, you see the sort of ridiculous piece of hardware that's shown in the background there getting dropped into the crane and wheeled around and stuff. So uh, anyway, if you're, if you're an MR geek at the end of this class, I'll let you know about when this goes because it's actually kind of fun. Okay, so I've said it a few times already, but this is a superconducting electromagnet. This is another teardown of that. Uh, MR scanners are, of course, superconducting electromagnets. Uh, I think we can bang through here. Uh, this is just sort of a cross section so you can see what's going on. You have Imaging volume of the bore where the patients can slide in and out. Uh, we'll have some kind of primary coil, and that primary coil is the windings we were just talking about, and they're bathed in, in a helium vessel, which is contained in the so called uh, uh, cryostat. I don't see a label here. But the point is, we're keeping this at about 4 Kelvin, which keeps everything below that, uh, that critical temperature, so we maintain superconductivity, and our B fields are low enough that we never exceed the B. Uh, there's a couple sort of hardware elements here that give us access to, uh, in this case, being able to refill the helium. The helium will boil off slowly, and we do at times have to replace it. Uh, and then there's a, a cold head for recompressing helium as well. We'll talk about the, the design just a little bit more as we get in the next couple of slides. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this. This is what's called the cold head. If you walk into an MR suite, you know, we'll do this from the lab, so you hear the sort of chirping in the background. It usually goes, and that chirping is this compressor. Uh, there is helium inside that cryostat that will uh, boil off ever so slightly. That, that, can be, uh, uh, that can be recaptured and then recompressed and re-injected back into the system. And what that basically means is that while the system is trying to cool itself a little bit, this compressor is making sure we never have uh, too little helium. And so as an MR scientist, you're always really sensitive in noticing if the cold head 
uh, is operational and running when you get into the MR suite. If it's not, uh, that's a problem uh, because it means that your system is probably losing helium, and if it loses enough helium, it can warm up enough, but then you have this negative feedback cycle that results in a, in a quench of the loss of helium. Uh, there's a helium fill port. I won't dwell on this for too much, but helium is pretty expensive. It boils off, depends on the system. There are so-called zero boil-off systems now. Uh, older systems boil it off at some rate per hour. Uh, but helium is pretty expensive. It's about $10 or $25 per liter. Older systems would use about 2,000 liters of liquid helium. So you'd have a pretty serious investment in helium uh, if that was, uh, uh, at least at the time, the, the design of those systems. Again, that's changed quite a bit now. Helium is interesting, though, right? So you ask the question, where does helium come from? Uh, here on planet Earth, it's extracted from natural gas. Uh, we have a so-called strategic helium reserve somewhere in Texas. So somewhere around World War II, they identified that this is a strategic uh, element or material, and we should have a reserve of this. So there's, I don't even know, tens of millions of liters held in big tanks somewhere in Texas. Uh, the interesting thing is that helium that escapes, the atmosphere is lost forever. Right? It just goes up, up, and up, and up, and up, and then it's gone, right? And so it's, it, is, it is something that we can exhaust. We don't know how to sort of make it, and we don't, we don't know so many places to find it, and that in part underlies the importance of having a, a helium reserve, uh, and perhaps the importance of these so-called zero boil-off designs, um, so which, again, capture and recompress any cryogen that's, that's boiling off. And so for the newer systems, that's saving you know, hundreds or even thousands of liters of uh, helium being boiled off uh, each year. So environmentally good and strategically good. Uh, we can so-called quench the field, right? So uh, that large magnetic field, that B0 field, there are times when you have to shut that field down. That can be done for routine maintenance, and that can be done in sort of a safe and controllable way. Uh, if we have to truly quench it, that means we flip up this plastic lid, hit the red stopper, and hope we don't get fired. Um, that's only going to really be performed under life-threatening circumstances. So. There's someone who uh, is trapped against the scanner right, by some heavy piece of hardware and they're losing consciousness and the building's on fire and then, bam, you quench, right? Uh, if you have to, you have to. If you don't have to, you don't. Uh, so this loss of superconductivity is a positive feedback cycle. What's basically happening when you hit that quench button is you're introducing uh, a, a conventional resistor into that circuit that leads to resistive heating that heats up that heats up the nearby superconducting elements, they get warm and resistive. And pretty certain the whole magnet is warming up, and you've blown you know, 2,000 liters of helium uh, literally out the cryogen vent and then out the side of your building, up to outer space, gone forever. So again, it's, it's a pretty serious thing to quench it. You do it if you have to, of course, uh, but only if it's so-called life threat. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so to turn it off, it's name is Safeway. We do it slowly. Yeah, there is. So you can actually you can actually hook a power like a sort of a reverse power supply in some sense up to the scanner and bleed the current off. And that current then goes out a wire. It's actually interesting. I'm not an electrical engineer, and I asked the, the service engineer. I said, well, "Where does the energy go? Right? Like you have a lot, you, have, you know, tens of I don't know, kilojoules stored in this thing, and it's going through this kind of weird amplifier thing that's plugged into the wall, and then not really sure. Right? The room's not heating." So there's, there's a riddle there that I, that I need to get answered. Uh, but there is a controlled way to ramp down the, the system. But we don't call it quenching, we call it ramping it down. And that can be done routinely. They can come in you know, and service the instrument. They can ramp it down. They can if you have to replace parts on the scanner, oftentimes you have to ramp it down. Right? You, can't, you, know, you can't even move certain elements around inside the system without ramping it down. Uh, so that can be done routinely, although they probably have some reasonable specifications and not doing it so too much. How long does that take? It's actually pretty quick, uh, less than an hour, um, something like that. And you can ramp it up in maybe a couple hours, something like that. I think it used to be quite long, but now they've, they've got that pretty well solved. Uh, we'll talk more about that. I don't think it's in this lecture, but we'll talk more about sort of ramping and cycling the system and tuning the system. Uh, cost of the quench, I won't, I won't sort of dig into this too much. We already sort of get it by the numbers, but you're losing a lot of helium that's expensive. You're probably losing downtime. You're paying an engineer to bring it back up. Uh, to, to spec, replace whatever parts you lost, and that kind of stuff. And then maybe you can think about the cost of electricity to ramp the field, although uh, that's, not, you know, that's sort of in the tens or hundreds of dollars, which is nothing relative to what it is. So let me see where we have the time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. 
So I, I said before, we really care about the bee field uh, homogeneity. Uh, and our scientists are, are odd lot in some sense. We, don't ever, we hardly ever talk about heterogeneity. We talk about inhomogeneity in a lot, right? And so we get worried about B field or B0 field inhomogeneity, how perfect or imperfect is our B0 field. Uh, so there's, what's, what's the problem here? Well, magnets aren't perfect. Whatever engineering design you have, they're not going to be perfect systems, right? And so uh, you're going to have hundreds of parts per million for the best bare magnets. Meaning if I build a superconducting coil, kind of using the rules and principles that I showed you before, about the best you're going to do is about 100 parts per million. So it's a 1.5 Tesla system, but it's plus minus something, right? A few micro Tesla, maybe dozens of micro Tesla. Uh, the v, and that's you know, what we call a bare magnet. We're going to add some components to the system now to help us tune and refine the field homogeneity. The B0 field inhomogeneity induces all kinds of problems for us. It causes image, phase artifacts, geometric distortions, lower signal to noise, off resonance problems. This will become more obvious as the course develops, but we want to have the most perfect magnetic field that we can, the most spatially uniform magnetic field that we can. So what are the options? Well, that bare magnet, when it's delivered, is not great. It's quite good, but it's not great. And they, at expense, can't really improve it much. So we have really two options, so-called passive shimming or active shimming. Passive shimming happens on installation. This is related to ramping up and ramping down the system. You actually, the, the field engineer will place ferromagnetic structures within the bore to help improve the field uniformity. So they have a measurement system uh, where they can measure and map the magnetic field across you know, the volume of interest that we care about. Uh, and upon measuring it, they can simulate where they would need to place a small, what we call shim, ferromagnetic shim over here, or maybe one over here, so we can push, pull, and shape the field to be as homogeneous as possible. So that's done sort of on installation, so called passive shimming. And there's another option after that, which is called active shimming. Every time we scan, every time we put a new object in the scanner, we can tune the field through active shimming. These are small, sort of always on currents. We sort of tune them up if we need to, we tune them down if we need to. Uh, they're out sort of in the periphery of the scanner a bit uh, and help us improve the field and uh, fine tune here what we call pre scan, sort of on an on exam by exam basis. So that anytime you want to, you can actively shim the field to improve it. Uh, so when we talk about B0 field inhomogeneity, we have a, a measurement that we could use, and it's simple. It's just saying, what's the maximum field minus the minimum field divided by some normalizing thing like the minimum field? We really only care about the field strength of what we call isocenter. So the coordinate system for our scanner is all oriented and designed around this so-called isocenter. You can think of it as the dead center of the scanner. Dead center, up, down, left, right. Um, and the expectations for the systems on delivery and after installation is that they're going to be homogeneous to within about a quarter part per million over a ball of about 40 centimeters, or maybe one part per million over a ball of about 50 centimeters. This is using an RMS uh, uh, calculation, but the point being that we're getting into that sort of parts per million or fewer uh, in terms of field homogeneity. So that means it's a 1.5. 1.500000 something field. Right? So it's a very, very precise uh, magnetic field. Uh, if you look at it, this is one of the systems that was undergoing install. So when it's being installed, the field is ramped down, and you can bring in ferromagnetic things like uh, pliers and such. Uh, what you'll see is these shim trays. So there's 12 of these shim trays around the scanner. This is the cryostat on the outside here, this big stainless steel tank. Concentric to that, is the magnetic field gradients uh, and the RF coil, the exciter, uh, and embedded sort of in all of that is also these so-called shim trays. You can pull these shim trays out. I think that's the next slide. Um, yeah, the shim tray just looks like this. It basically holds a deck of cards, and in every deck, the engineer can place the right amount of cards to help them further shape the field you know, to specification. So the trays can be empty, and maybe you're out of spec, and then you can dial in the cards in the deck as much as he needs to. Uh, either no shim card, large shim card, small, uh, or in this case, the shim deck has been sealed. Now, these are ferromagnetic, right? So how do you get a big tray of ferromagnetic cards out of a scanner that's ramped up to one and a half Tesla? You ramp down the field, right? So you have to ramp down the, you have to map the field, uh, then calculate where shims need to be placed, ramp down the field, plot the shim deck, slot in a bunch of cards, Put them all back in, ramp up the field, measure again. And then you got it or you didn't. You, know, you pulled the 
ramp down the field, call the shins back, put the shins, put the shins back in, ramp up the field, map it, and go out and repeat. Uh, these guys are pretty good. They're using simulation software to do it. So uh, usually, in, you know, sometimes once or even just two times, rarely three, they can get the, sh uh, the uh, system to meet their delivery specification, which is again, two parts. Uh, uh, this is basically what I just said. We have a sort of process that they would go through for uh, getting to the point where the RMS field is like in a happy place, ramping up, adjusting the shin trains, and so forth. So we can skip past that. Uh, there is also so called active shin coils, right, within the magnet. So once the system is sort of ramped up, there's still ways to further manipulate the magnetic field strength through these so called active fields. Uh, and they can, they can uh, uh, help accommodate for uh, differences in the field that arise because of the presence of the patient or the coils that we're using for doing the imaging or any other sort of thing that might perturb the field during the exam or chapter inquiry. Uh, I'll show one maybe simple example of how it's been placed together. Um, yeah, that's right. I just said that the field's still imperfect even with the use of active and passive shin. So what the, what, what, what the here, so this next slide here, this is just showing uh, here, uh, this is just saying, look, you know, if I have a big solenoid that generates my B0 field, I could also build a system that has some additional solenoid elements. I could add some current to this element or this element, and I could manipulate the magnetic field inside the anti-isocenter. So these are just the so-called active elements. There's windings of wire inside the system that I can use to further tune and manipulate uh, the system. Uh, this is what we call a Maxwell uh, paracoil. We'll see this again because the, uh, something uh, that's interesting in MR is we want the most perfect field uh, that we can get because that will you know, sort of give us the best overall image quality. And then we're going to use gradient fields where they're gonna, that are going to specifically change the magnetic field in very controlled ways. Uh, the gradient fields also use this so-called Maxwell paracoil. So in this very simple example, if I run current through this uh, coil, say in the positive sense, and then it's in the negative sense for this lower coil, I can slightly increase the field at, say, the top of the scanner, I can slightly decrease the field at the foot of the scanner. And so in this sense, I have a magnetic field gradient now going from B0 plus some delta to B0 to B0 minus some delta. Now, on installation, maybe I have a delta, right? My field's not perfect. So now I turn on these currents in such a way as to reduce the offset uh, across space. I think that's what the next slide is showing. So here, imagine that on delivery, you have a system whose field strength is imperfect. The magnetic field that we care about, we said, points along the K direction, points in the Z direction. So we typically have arrows like this indicating direction along Z, and then the magnitude tells us about the field strength. So in this very simple example, uh, these gradient coils are off. Red, in this case, means off. And when they are off, I have an imperfect field, right? I want my field to be perfect, but it wasn't engineered correctly or not precisely, or there's some sample in my object. Uh, the point is I can turn these currents on and even out the field. That's what the next slide is here. So by uh, energizing these coil elements to the right amount of current, then I can smooth out that field such that I have, in principle, B0 in all positions. And that's the, that's the, the, the sort of basics of, of I think this is probably the last thing that we'll pull through uh, this evening. Uh, and it's really just about MR rooms and the, the design of the room itself. Um, in any MR environment, there's four zones. So this kind of gets back to this topic of safety zones uh, with wonderful names, zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. Uh, zone one is basically just entrance to the facility. Zone two is where an MR patient is going to be screened and maybe prepared. They're going to meet reception. They're going to get some introduction to what's about to happen and get that screen form, fill it out so that uh, the techs and the nurses and so forth can figure out if there's any uh, identifiable risk for that particular patient. After they've gone through that sort of uh, rigmarole, then they come back into zone three, which is the first zone that's really restricted access. So it's only screen MR uh, subjects, uh, patients, uh, and personnel, uh, personnel that have expertise in the MR environment. Uh, there's patient privacy concerns as well, so there's kind of a in that environment. But this environment is sort of the environment that's immediately outside of zone four, which is the actual MR zone itself. So in that case, it's, it's more restricted, uh, and it's only the screen MR patients under the direct supervision of someone who's trained in MR. When we uh, have the MR labs, 
We'll spend a little bit of time talking about things. We'll, we'll go through these zones. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about things here, and then we will get a chance to go to the MR and try to scan our itself and uh, just get a better sense of what these systems are like. Um, a couple things to keep in mind, I've, I've mentioned the sum already, uh, but the main field requires some shielding. So this is a system that was being installed here uh, several years ago, and what you'll see is this, uh, these here are just uh, sheets of, of steel, just low carbon steel. Um, and these sheets are being placed up against the wall, so you can see panels of steel against the wall here, against the floor, and so forth. And they just form magnetic shielding such that the B0 field that you need for your MR experiment isn't getting too far into the hallway or to the room above you or these kinds of things. And so that can reduce the installation cost, meaning you don't need a giant room to host uh, the system. Uh, and of course, reduce interference of your MR system with things that are outside of it. Uh, we just call this passive B0 shielding and we just throw up iron all over the room. Uh, it's actually obviously quite heavy, so the room has to structurally support it. And it's not cheap. Uh, you might think, oh, it's just steel, how much can it be? But it's easily tens of thousands of dollars in, in labor and materials to do something like that. And so the manufacturers have, of course, taken this on some and generated so-called active visceral shielding. We saw that going back to 10 15 slides. So they have additional superconducting coils wound in the opposite direction to the B0 field, and they can use that to shape the external field as well as we push the internal fields kind of down. Uh, it will oppose, obviously, the main B field strength a little bit, so you've got to play this uh, optimization game between the two. Um, and it will uh, otherwise it reduce the installation rate. I think it's going to work well. It will increase the weight of the scan and maybe reduce the, the weight of the room. And the goal here is really to get the stray field outside of the room to be less than five gauss. Five gauss is identified by FDA as so it would be a, a safe exposure level for magnetic fields. So any medical device should operate safely within uh, but not exceeding five gauss. So typically the five gauss line is somewhere inside the MR room but at zone four, and then from outside of zone four, it's going to be, uh, it's not going to pose an issue for patients. But that's not uniformly true. In fact, at Reagan Hospital, there's this funny little yellow tape and these little cones that are designated the five gauss line in the middle of the hallway. So, anyway, the engineer gets a B for that one. Uh, so just sort of pointing out the magnitude of what's, what's happening here. This is a, a, an old 70s system installed up in Oregon, Oregon Health Sciences University. This was an unshielded magnet, uh, meaning it did not have active shielding, and it's a 7T system. Uh, and they had to add 250 tons of steel shielding. You can see it's about three feet thick, surrounding basically the entire room, so that 7T field was isolated from interfering with you know, someone's life. Uh, kind of a remarkable feat. This has changed dramatically. This is really installed about 15 years ago now. Uh, the install for these systems has come down dramatically, but it's still, uh, it's still pretty serious business. And that's all, again, all this shielding business is right now so far just talking about keeping the D0 field inside the room, right? So it's not causing problems outside. And then I think we switch topics to a slightly different form of shielding. So we have another problem, which is uh, these systems also use incredibly sensitive receivers, right? You have this coil that's placed on your, on your body and it has to pick up this micro or hundreds of nanovolt signal from your body and use that to generate a diagnosable clinical magnetic resonance image, right? So what's the problem? Well, the RF field that you're detecting coming out of someone's body is in the, in the range of, of tens of megahertz. We'll talk much more about why it's in that range later, but it's related to the fact that they're interested in imaging hydrogen at one and a half or three tesla processional frequency is consequently 64 or 128 megahertz. And that's right in the neighborhood of the electromagnetic radiation for all kinds of things, right, including radio stations. And so the rooms uh, somewhat beautifully have to be clad in copper as well to form a so-called Faraday cage. Uh, the reason for that is to keep uh, stray electromagnetic radiation that's outside of the room from getting into your room, into your coil, and causing contamination of the signals that you're measuring. So uh, it's, in some sense, it's really kind of pretty, uh, but it's also really expensive to build a Faraday cage after you've already shielded the room uh, before you throw up the dial and cancel the interference. Okay, so when we come back on Thursday, we'll, we'll sort of get to work a little bit more. So this is kind of a lot of e yammering, uh, obviously. But what we'll talk about is sort of that, that concept of bulk magnetization and the idea of nuclear precession.